In today's episode, we revisit a crime watch appeal from 1991, a puzzling case, hitmen driving a distinctive Cadillac style car, and blasted a man in the chest with a shotgun in a contract style hit. First, we look at the crime watch reconstruction and then the police investigation afterwards. Tonight's first case is strangely unsettling. It's like a, a killing from some second-rate Hollywood screenplay. And indeed, there is an American feature to the crime. Killers cruising round in what looked like a white Cadillac and shooting someone in cold blood. But in contrast to murders in the movies, the victim, Alan Leppard, had no criminal connections and no known enemies. And the setting was an English hamlet just a few yards up from the village pub. Alan's girlfriend, Brenda, has helped us to make this film, and you'll see her in an interview, though an actress takes her part in the reconstruction. It's three weeks before Easter at the pub in Moncton, not far from Ramsgate in Kent. It was 6.15 approximately in the evening, and I was just opening the pub. This gentleman walked in, attracted my attention. Is Mr. Leopard in here? Who? Somebody told me he drank in here. He had a gold bracelet on one wrist. There was a gold watch on the other wrist, quite smartly dressed with a red tie on, black swept back hair, quite piercing eyes, square jaw, and lines sunk back from the nose into his face, around the mouth. In fact, Alan Leopard lived two doors down from the pub. He'd moved to Moncton four months earlier with his girlfriend, Brenda, and the couple were planning to get married. She'd been divorced for several years, but Alan was waiting for his divorce to be completed. I spent so long, and I think he did, find, trying to find the right person, and um, we felt we'd found it. Alan was a very kind man. He was very gentle. He wasn't romantic in the sense that he'd bring flowers, but he never hid his feelings. Oh. I've finished that digging. Do you fancy going down the pub later? Just for a quick drink? Mm, I suppose we could, if you want to. You're not very keen, are you? We don't have to go, you know. It's just that it's so nice being on our own. Let's just stay. OK. I was sitting in my lounge, it was about 8.30 with my mother. We were watching television. All of a sudden I heard a scuffle outside. I looked out the window and I saw some boys and they were arguing. Soon after that I noticed a big American car cruising up the road at very slow speed. But then it continued to go up and down the road on and off about the next couple of hours. I was watching television. Alan had dropped off to sleep. Alan, I think there's someone at the door. Mm. Well, shall I go and see who it is? Yeah. It was by our bedroom clock, just after 10 o'clock, but it was a bit fast. And I went to the bedroom window and I saw two people at the side of this large white car. And I turned the landing light on to go down to see who it was. Don't know who it was, but they've gone. Still, if it's important, they'll come back later. Around the same time, and just a few yards down the road, two holidaymakers from a nearby caravan park got a good view of the white car's driver. Twenty minutes later, another witness saw the car still there. Well, it was about 20 past 10. I was leaving my girlfriend's house and there was a big white American car parked where I normally park my car. This man walked past the pub and got into the left-hand side. So I presume it's a left-hand drive car and just drove off. I believe in the power of love. 
Then, for 25 minutes, the big car disappeared. I think about 22 quarters to 11. Somebody knocked at the door again. You go this time. And I went to the window again, and I said, it's the same people. And we both went downstairs. Who is it? What do you want? Who is it? He went out the door. What the hell's all this about? Then an almighty bang. And a scream. Um, I went to go outside. And I got to the corner of the back of the cottage. And Alan came round the corner. And uh, as he came towards me, he must have moved his hands because I was absolutely covered in blood. Um, and I started screaming. I think he said, get in. I think because he was worried for me. He was just a grey colour. And uh, he was just going. And there was nothing I could do to stop him. Nick Vidis, what was the motive? Why would somebody want to kill him? We have a number of ideas about the motive, but uh, there's nothing that we can really pin down at this stage. But as far as you're concerned, he was a completely innocent victim. Of that is correct. He's a completely this. innocent victim of a terrible crime. I mean, it looks as, to some extent as though there might have been sort of professional killers hired, but I mean, they seem to be rather amateur professionals. Well, they, they certainly do, yes. Uh, and the, the Cadillac, or whatever it was, that drew a lot of attention to them, was it a Cadillac? I mean, you're not exactly we're not, sure what it was. We're not sure of the maker or model of the car. All I can say is a light-coloured, possibly white, large American-style saloon motor car. So presumably you'd like to know anybody who had one of those white cars uh, up to Easter and we certainly hasn't would. been driving it since. That's right, and uh, where it could be now, perhaps scrap dealers or some scrapyard may have it, but uh, anybody who's seen a car up until Easter and it's now disappeared, we'd like to hear from. Not entirely sure whether there were two or, or three occupants. One stage there seemed to be only one, but we've got a fairly good description of the white-haired or light-haired driver who was seen by the the two people coming from yes, the caravan Yes, indeed park. we have. We have a, a man there who's uh, believed in his late forties, possibly about five foot seven, sitting in the car, and uh, uh, the e-fit you've got. And what about the guy who came into the White Stag pub a couple of weeks before the, the killing? I mean, presumably you need to eliminate this chap who might be perfectly innocent of the whole affair. We would like to trace this man. He is uh, a man who went into the pub about three weeks before. Uh, described as being 35 to 38 years of age, wearing a gold bracelet and gold watch. We'd very much like to trace that man and, and speak with him. There's something else you need to eliminate, I know, because uh, another white American car was seen not far away that same night. There was about 10 past 11 on the same evening in the village of Minster, which is next door to Moncton. There was a similar car scene with two men getting into it in the New Inn car park, which is a pub in the centre of the village, and we'd very much like to trace those two men to see whether or not they can assist with this inquiry. OK, I mean, you're, you're almost certain this car had nothing to, to do with it and it needs to be eliminated. We, we think we can eliminate that, but we'd like to hear from the people who were with it. I'd mentioned the caravan park, the Fox Hunter Caravan Park. About 300 caravans, I think, were part of this. It was the Easter weekend, of, of course. Now, you've spoken to most people who were there that weekend, but I gather not everyone. That's right. There are over 300 caravans on this site, and it was a very busy Easter weekend, quite nice weather and we'd like to hear from anybody who so far we have not seen or hasn't spoken to us that can may have been down during that weekend. Can you promise them discretion? Everything they give us will be treated in the strictest of competence. OK, there's uh, a reward. I doubt that would be anybody's prime motive in this, but the family have put up a reward of £5,000. Here's the number, if you can, help 
081-811-8181. That's 081-811-8181. Or you can call the Murder Inquiry Room at Margate. On April the 1st, 1991, hitmen blasted Alan Leopard on his doorstep with a 12-ball shotgun, then fled in a big white car, leaving him to die in his lover Brenda Long's arms. Nine months later, Brenda Long would be found dead in her bath, drugged and then drowned. It's a double killing nine months apart that has baffled detectives and neighbours in a sleepy village for over 30 years. It sounds like a case from a Sunday night British crime drama. There remains questions about the car used by the so-called Cadillac killers and a man adorned with gold bracelet and a gold watch who called in at a village pub asking about Alan. Alan Leopard was shot on Easter Monday, April the 1st, 1991. The case gripped the nation and Crime Watch host Nick Ross described it as like a killing from some second-rate Hollywood screenplay when they ran the reconstruction. The mystery deepened on December 28th, that year, when fitness fanatic Brenda, who was 42 years old, was found drowned in a bath. She had been drugged with diethyl ether. Her body found in the bath on December the 28th. Initially, her death looked like suicide, but a post-mortem examination established that the diethyl ether in her bloodstream and marks around her face and mouth, which suggested that she had been put to sleep with a cloth over her mouth and then drowned. A pathologist said Brenda suffered a deliberate and violent assault. Recording a verdict for an awful killing, the coroner described it as a strange and disturbing case. Who killed them and why remains a mystery. The car, thought to be a Cadillac, has never been traced. The murders that look like a third party hit job. The baffling thing is, why would the killers use such a noticeable car? Police detectives have said whoever pulls the trigger probably has no connection with the deceased. Unless you can connect the person who might have the motive with the person who pulled the trigger, that link is very difficult to establish. Alan, who was 43 years old, a quantity surveyor, and account manager Brenda set up home in December 1990 after an office romance. They both had complicated love lives. Divorcee Brenda had left her car dealer boyfriend Arthur Hibbert. Dad of one Alan Leopard had walked out on his fourth wife Wendy after seven months. Three weeks before his murder, a man wearing a red tie, gold bracelet and a gold watch called in at the White Stag pub. Two doors down from Alan and Brenda's cottage, asking for him. On the night of the killing, the couple were in bed watching TV when they heard a knock on the door just after 10 pm. Brenda went to the window and saw the two men buy a large white car. The men returned 45 minutes later and Alan went to the door. Brenda told Crime Watch that an almighty bang and a scream, and I went outside. Alan came round the corner. And he came towards me. He must have moved his hands because I was absolutely covered in blood and I started screaming. He shouted, get in. I think because he was worried for me. He was just a grey colour and he was just going and there was nothing I could do to stop him. Brenda said of kind, gentle Alan, I spent so long, I think I did trying to find the right person. Following his death, Brenda Long moved to a flat 15 miles away in Whistable, where she later died. Ex-boyfriend car dealer Mr Hibbert reportedly tried to rekindle their relationship after Alan Leopard's death. He was questioned by police but released without charge. Nine days before Brenda Long's inquest into her death, Hibbert was discovered in a Ford Escort with a hose pipe leading from the exhaust into the car. He was taken to hospital and he recovered. He told Brenda's inquest she had been very depressed and he had taken back to her flat on the night before her death. He slept on the sofa and left the next day. When he returned later, he climbed in through the open window to check on her, but found out she was dead. Brenda's death scene was initially treated as a suicide until the post-mortem found the ether. An empty pill bottle was in the bath and beside the tub was a gin and tonic glass and a Christmas card she had written to Alan saying how much she missed him. 
A neighbour said I never thought she was the type of person who would take her own life. I found out when she went on holiday to Jersey that summer, she managed to find herself a friendly waiter out there, so she wasn't that depressed. She was a very lovable lady. She was of the view that Mr Hibbert wouldn't be involved in anything that would cause pain or suffering to anybody. She wouldn't think ill of him. Alan's third wife, Patricia Leopard, said he was a charmer who walked out after she rumbled an affair. Patricia said he was a cheating ale, but he didn't deserve to be killed. When I met him, he was living with an older woman two doors down. He was a serial cheat. When I was told he'd been murdered, it was an absolute shock. I know he cheated on women, but he didn't deserve that. He deserves justice. Kent Police has renewed its appeal for information about the two murders, but no information has ever come forward. A police detective said, 32 years on, we are still no closer to establishing a motive for either murder. We can't say definitely that the two deaths were linked, but there is every chance there is a connection between the two. He said that the advances in DNA technology meant that information would be available to detectives that would not have been around 32 years ago. There was speculation at the time that this could have been a contract style killing. But there is nothing to suggest that either Alan Leopard or Brenda Long had any involvement with criminality. Unsolved murder cases are never closed and this case is still open. <laughs>